Hello everyone, it's Tuesday. Welcome to the Content Patch. My name is Total Biscuit, joined by today's gaming news and comment. Coming up in the show, Ryan Davis of Giant Bomb has passed away at age 34. Ubisoft says that Zombie U was not even close to being profitable. Nintendo refuses to lay off staff despite profit woes. And Amiga Games has been purchased by the Writers Group Film Corporation. All this and the OC Remix track of the day is coming your way right about now. Brian Davis, one of the founding members of Giant Bomb, has passed away at the age of 34. Davis, who was on his honeymoon at the time, passed away on July the 3rd, and the announcement of his death was made by Giant Bomb on July the 8th. Giant Bomb issued a statement that said, Obviously we're all stunned over here. Ryan was a good friend to all of us. It's odd to remember that for someone who could be so acerbic at times, and despite knowing him for almost a decade, I honestly don't recall ever actually being mad at him. He had an unconventional type of kindness that expressed itself more strongly the longer you knew him, and despite his teasing nature, he always managed to make his close friends feel loved when his attention turned towards you. Many of you know that Ryan was recently married. In the face of this awfulness, many of us will at least always remember him as we last saw him, outrageously, uproariously happy, looking forward to his next adventure with the biggest grin his face could hold. The consolation we can feel from that is minuscule compared to the hole that Ryan's absence will leave in our lives. That's not a hole that is possible to fill. It's just something that we'll have to get used to walking around with, and that will not happen for a long, long time. Ryan, of course, was one of the founding members alongside Jeff Gerstmann, Alex Navarro, Brad Shoemaker, and Vinny Caravella of the Giant Bomb website, which continues to this day to be one of the most popular and well-respected gaming journalism sites. And he was the anchor host of the very popular Giant Bombcast. This comes as a massive shock, and hearing that someone that you respected and, more to the point, listened to on a weekly basis, perhaps for the last two years, suddenly passed away in awful circumstances. At the age of 34, 30, 34, that's unbelievably tragic, considering that he only just got married, he passed away on his honeymoon. We only just found out about this because the family has taken a good amount of time to try to come to terms with it, although I can't imagine that a mere few days is enough. This hit me harder than I thought it would. I, I don't recall the last time when someone that I very much looked up to as one of the linchpins of this particular industry, like an example to be followed, someone that was rock solid at his job and obviously loved every last minute of it, who was always enthusiastic, basically impossible to tie down, boundless joy for the industry, and yet was also capable of being incredibly intelligent, capable of excellent critical writing, the ability to take a game apart and really examine what was right and wrong with it, and took so much joy in doing it as well and sharing it with the world. He seemed like the kind of person that would always be fun to be around, constantly throwing jokes into the show on a weekly basis, constantly being the anchor of that show, making sure that it was a fantastic show to listen to every single time. It's a model that many gaming podcasts have looked to and said, yeah, this is the way you should do a gaming show. And as a result, it was really only one of two gaming shows that I would ever listen to on a regular basis. And certainly the one that I've listened to the most. Hearing his bombastic introduction every time he started up the show was always joyous. You knew you were in for a good time every time you heard that, and now we'll never hear that again. I think Ryan was the kind of person that you would look to and say, I wish I was that good. I'm talking about somebody that can, regardless of the circumstances, just personify what's fun about this industry, can show boundless passion for what he does and for the scene that he's involved in, that is capable of being critical, analytical, and well-respected without falling into the trap of being overly cynical. Like, I wish I could be as good a person as Ryan was. I, I really do. It's been a very long time, I think, since I've felt and express the kind of enthusiasm that we heard from him on a weekly basis. The fact that he was able to just summon that up out of seemingly nowhere, but it speaks volumes to just how much he cared. 
and now we won't hear that again. I've been trying to record this part of the show all day. Uh, as soon as I heard the news, I tried to do the show and it, I failed. Took a couple of hours off, tried again. Just, I couldn't do it. I, it, it sounds strange to talk that way about someone that you've never met, but it's somebody that you let into your life once a week for three hours and listen to what he had to say. It's like the idea of a famous radio announcer or personality suddenly passing away, only yet more tragic. At the age of 34, I think the last time I ever felt like this was when John Peel died. And at least you can say, well, he had a good run. The real tragedy about Ryan is that he was really just getting started. It's not fair. You know, for the last couple of years that I was listening to that show, there'd always be that part of the show just at the beginning, just after the introductions, where maybe they'd start talking about something in their personal lives and I'd kind of skip ahead. And recently it got to the point where I was skipping ahead so much that I... I barely even realized Ryan had got married. And now I realize that that was the last I was going to hear about him. In my rush to get to the gaming stuff, get to the stuff that I was interested in, I missed the opportunity to learn more about a wonderful person whose life was tragically cut short. When I can face it, I'm sure I'll go back to the podcast archives and try and learn a bit more about who he was as a person. Ryan and the entire Giant Bomb crew have always been an inspiration to me. They've been a shining example of what you can do on your own with a lot of talent and a lot of determination. They were and still are a bastion of independence, as well as a credit to the industry. I can't imagine how hard it must be to go back into that office, considering that you've spent so many years with a, a small-knit crew of people and realize that part of you is just missing and you'll never get it back. My heart goes out to the family as well as to the giant bomb crew, and I wish them all the best. Ubisoft, the Wii U's biggest third-party supporter, has revealed further information about what exactly happened with the launch of the console and, more importantly, their flagship core game title that was released with the launch of the Wii U, which, of course, went by the name of Zombie U. The chairman and CEO of Ubisoft, who has historically been one of the biggest and most vocal supporters of the console, said that Zombie U, in fact, was not profitable. In fact, it wasn't even close to being profitable, and as a direct result there are no plans or even a desire to create a sequel for the title. Zombie U received fairly reasonable reviews after a lot of pre-release hype as it was marketed as the big core game title for the Wii U's launch. It was one of the most added on titles to those who adopted the system early as well, although the reviews it received were mixed. Regardless, impressions of the title at least early on were relatively positive. And as a direct result, one would think that would have resulted in a reasonable amount of sales. But of course, the problem being is that the system didn't actually sell all that well, so the amount of users that could actually play this title were significantly diminished. Ubisoft has also confirmed that this is the reason that Rayman Legends has ended up going multi-platform as opposed to being a Wii U exclusive. Ubisoft says that they must find a way to ensure the creativity of those games could have a big enough audience. We hope it will take off at the moment. We've said let's do through Christmas and see where we are from there. Activision, another third-party publisher that had released a number of titles around the launch of the Wii U, has confirmed there are no announcements at this time as to future Wii U titles. This of course piles up upon the issue with EA, who flat out said that Frostbite 3 simply would not run on the Wii U, and as a direct result, they would not be bringing games to the platform using that engine. Since then, Peter Moore has also said that the lack of online engagement for the Wii U is troubling, and as a result, it seems like the box is out of sync with the future of EA. Oh dear, oh dear. It's actually kind of disappointing to hear that Zombie U won't be getting a sequel or anything along those lines. Now, I, it doesn't really matter what people think of the game, because I've said this a thousand times before, whenever anyone brings this up. This is not the first time this has happened, when a game just hasn't sold all that many copies. Immediately, people will point us like, oh, it's not that good, that's why. Yeah, if only, if only games sold 
in direct proportion to how good they actually were. That is absolute nonsense. You just need to look at the numbers for Resident Evil 6 to figure out that it's like absolutely got nothing to do with that. It's all about brand strength and marketing. The fact that Zombie U didn't sell all that well is really rather disappointing because I think that it was nudging itself in the right direction. It was actually dipping into a genre that's becoming more and more popular now. Roguelike elements are being included in more and more titles as are harder core survival elements. Zombie U did have both of those things. It had the nice kind of permadeath system. I think that there was a lot of potential for development there. Was it a perfect game? Absolutely not. It had its own problems, had plenty of them, but it was reasonably innovative and Seeing a new IP just being shot down because of the decision to put it on a console that flat out has not performed as well as people had projected, well, that is a tragedy indeed. It's certainly not a tragedy, of course, to see Rayman Legends actually going multi-platform because then the game will actually sell. Bearing in mind that Origins only kind of just scraped what it needed in order to actually make a sequel, the fact that Legends is coming out to all platforms and will hopefully have a lot more support behind it is a positive thing indeed. As far as I'm concerned, Rayman Origins was one of the best platformers I've played in a very long time, and I don't even like platformers, but the colorful and imaginative nature as well as the variety available in that particular title did kind of sell me on it. I own Rayman Origins, I think on three or, no, is it four different platforms? Yeah, I own it on PC, PlayStation Vita, Nintendo Wii, and and the iPad version. Yeah, so I like Rayman a lot, and I'm really looking forward to Rayman Legends. I'm hoping that the multi-platform approach will work there, but unfortunately, that does of course leave the Wii U in a really awkward position. It is not a unique position, however, absolutely not. It is not the kind of position that Nintendo has never been in before. The DS was in that position. Basically, until Nintendogs came out, people were writing off the DS as a gimmicky waste of time. And then suddenly, pop, out comes Nintendogs from Nintendo, and suddenly the machine actually gets the installed user base to be an extremely successful handheld. Nintendo can do that, but they have yet to provide the game that will actually be that killer app seller, and I do not believe Pikmin 3 is that game. It may very well be that Nintendo requires a new IP. Nintendogs was a new IP, as strange as it was. I mean, it was barely even a game, but it took advantage of the system. And the only game that Nintendo has really made that fully takes advantage of the system's capabilities so far is Nintendo Land, which is not enough to sell a system. I'm sorry. It's a bunch of cute mini games. It's fun to play with friends. We need something just mind-blowing that actually uses that kind of functionality. We really do. And so far, there isn't one. I have to wonder if even a new Smash Brothers will actually be enough. You can bring out new releases from the same franchises and you'll bring back the hardcore fans, but you're bringing back the same hardcore fans. And honestly, that was not why the Wii and the DS were successful. The DS eventually got a massive swell of third-party support, and as a result, there were games for everybody. There were great casual games, great edutainment games, and great core games on that platform. Some absolutely fantastic titles there. As of yet, we don't have that on Wii U, and right now there isn't a reason. It's a bit of a catch-22, isn't it? We don't buy Wii U's because there aren't any good games for them, there aren't any good games for them because the installed user base is low. How do you fix that? Well, generally speaking, it falls upon the head of the first party themselves. So let's see what can be done there. Regardless of Nintendo's woes, the president Satoru Iwata has confirmed that they will not be letting staff go. In the annual investors meeting, Nintendo said that if we reduce the number of employees for better short-term financial results, employee morale will decrease. And I sincerely doubt employees who fear that they may be laid off will be able to develop software titles that could impress people around the world. I believe we can become profitable with the current business structure in consideration of exchange rate trends and popularization of our platforms in the future. Well, I can hardly not respect them for that. I mean, that is probably one of the gutsiest things and one of the most awesome things I've heard from a company in quite some time. And this is from a company that I've criticized heavily over the past few months for making some rather anti-consumer decisions. But when it comes to taking care of their own, they do appear to have a particularly good attitude. I like the fact that they have the idea that if you have a loyal and talented base of people working for you, then you will be able to create quality products, and that is what they believe will actually get them out of their current rut. 
I mean, that's pretty much the most straightforward, honest, and fantastic way of looking at business, isn't it? I really hope they're right. I really do. I don't want to see Nintendo go under in the way that Sega did. And frankly, good luck regaining the trust of the consumer if you get rid of the people that made the games which earned that trust in the first place. You need that talent, you need that creative spark, and there must be the enthusiasm to actually release a great game. If you put the employees under undue pressure, it will affect the product, and we've seen that time and time again with games from EA and Activision. It is not a good thing at all. Your creative people need to have the freedom to be creative and feel secure in being able to do that and focus entirely on their job. So good for Nintendo on that one. Let's hope that it actually works out for them. And finally, Amiga Games, which is the company which has a massive library of classics, of course, from the Amiga platform, has been bought by the Writers Group Film Corporation. The deal cost them about $500,000, and according to their press release, that means that they will acquire the rights to over 300 gaming properties. Lately, the Amiga Games company has been licensing out these properties to various different developers and various different platforms. And as a result, we are seeing titles pop up here and there in various remakes. This is exciting to me. You want to know why? Because... Funnily enough, even though I never owned an Amiga, I played a huge amount of Amiga games because most Amiga games ended up getting ported eventually over to the Risk OS system, which is what I used to use when I was a kid. I suppose the question is exactly what rights they've managed to acquire. It's difficult to find out information as to exactly which titles are currently owned by Amiga Incorporated. Their website is a little bit old, let's just say and it has listed various ports for a lot of BlackBerry systems, including the Playbook, assuming that anyone actually owns that bloody thing. Looking at their shop, there's a list of ports including Gods, Alien Breed Special Edition, Desert Strike, Turrican 2, Chaos Engine, and of course the ever-infamous Zool franchise. Now, if this is the case, and they actually own a lot of this stuff, then this is rather good news, because a lot of those games were really, really good. Incredibly good, as it turns out. These are the kind of things that would definitely do well from a modern coat of paint. And Gods in itself is a great example. Gods was a Bitmap Brothers game alongside some fantastic titles like Chaos Engine, like Magic Pockets. If they actually have the rights to that kind of stuff, it would be great to see not only continuations of those IPs because they were really good to begin with, but HD remakes. I would love to see that. Gods was a great looking game in and of itself, but I would absolutely love to see it polished up. It had a fantastic art style. I think it would do really, really well with a little high definition coat of paint. So potentially very good news here. I'm interested to see what they plan on doing with this IP. Hopefully they won't just sit on it. That would be rather annoying to say the least. That's my childhood that you have in your hands. Tread softly for you tread on my dreams. All right, folks, that pretty much is me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching the content patch. Before I go, I'd like to give you the OC Remix track of the day. I wondered if I could find a fitting tribute to Ryan as the track to close out the show. Well, I know for a fact, of course, that his favorite game was Super Mario Bros. 3. And I thought I'd try and find a track that kind of represented his personality. I don't really think that he would have wanted people to be mopey. He was always so bombastic and as a direct result i'd like to play something just a little bit light-hearted this is a remix of the world 3 map track from super mario brothers 3 for the nintendo entertainment system released in 1988 the remix artist in this instance was mustin and this is just a little bit samba it's called la samba de agua thank you very much folks i'll see you next time la samba de agua written by koji kondo from the super mario brothers 3 video game performed by Mustin. Enjoy. Mm -hmm.